since the release of Napoleon. The latest epic film by prolific filmmaker Sir Ridley Scott, there has been renewed interest in the life and conquests of the legendary historical figure. Each generation comes to acquaint with the man through moving images, and rightly so, as there's always some new thing being discovered about him and his reign. So today, we'll travel back to the late 18th and early 19th centuries to revisit his life, which, strikingly, coincided with the culmination of the French Revolution and interspersed with various regime changes. Together, let's take a much closer look at Napoleon Bonaparte's meteoric rise to power from being a regular Corsican soldier to Emperor of France, and ultimately, to Master of Europe. Hello and welcome to History of Life, where we relive history's greatest moments and the eras in between. For this video, we're going to analyse who Napoleon Bonaparte really was and what made his legacy so enduring. Nothing elicited equal awe and trepidation in the hearts of men during the latter part of the early modern age than hearing the name Napoleon Bonaparte. The decorated commander, who rose to the highest ranks of French military and politics, came from a modest upbringing despite his family's gentry. Napoleon was born on the 15th of August, 1769, on Corsica, a small island in the Mediterranean Sea. Just a year before Napoleon's birth, the French managed to occupy the Republic of Corsica, which had also been under the rule of the Republic of Genoa for centuries. Napoleon was the second of six surviving siblings to Carla Maria Bonaparte, descended from a minor Tuscan noble family, and Maria Letizia Ramolino, descended from a minor Genoese noble family. The Bonaparte family was of noble lineage, but they were by no means wealthy. Carlo Bonaparte, for most of his early life, fought for Corsican independence alongside Pasquale di Paoli, the leader of the Corsican nationalist movement, who also happened to be Napoleon's childhood hero. As the French successfully conquered Corsica, Carlo and Letizia, who by now had two young children, including Napoleon, must have felt that securing their family was more important than an armed struggle. While they were not materially wealthy, the Bonaparte family did have a somewhat comfortable life, thanks to Carlo's work as an assessor for the monarchy. When Napoleon turned nine, he was sent to northern central France, where he enrolled in the military academy in Orbe. At that time, Napoleon was still adapting to the French language and culture, considering he had spoken Corsican and Italian all his life. It was said he was bullied for not being able to speak French properly, alongside his short stature, so you can just imagine how this had greatly shaped the young Napoleon's outlook toward getting back against those whom he perceived wronged him. To counter the bullying, Napoleon buried himself in his studies where he excelled in subjects such as mathematics, history, and geography. Upon turning 15, Napoleon moved to Paris to study at the renowned École Militaire, where he was training to become an artillery officer. In September of 1785, at the age of 16, Napoleon finally graduated and was promoted to second lieutenant to the 1st Artillery Regiment. Napoleon served in this position until 1789, which coincided with the outbreak of the French Revolution. However, Napoleon still felt loyalty toward his homeland and the Corsican nationalists. Later in the year, he decided to return to Corsica, hoping to serve alongside his hero, Pasquale de Pauli. To his utter dismay and disenchantment, Pasquale doesn't take Napoleon in. Owing to what Pasquale felt was Carlo Bonaparte's betrayal of Corsican independence in exchange for French servitude. Regardless, Napoleon stayed put in Corsica where he clashed with Pasquale as the Corsican nationalist tried to depose the French leaders once again. At this time, Napoleon began to align himself with the Jacobins, the extreme pro-Republican group of political activists who rebelled against the French monarchy, leading to their ouster. Not too long after, Pasquale succeeded in warding off French control with the protection of the British government. It was for this very reason, in 1793, that Napoleon turned his back forever on his childhood hero as the Bonaparte family finally left their home island of Corsica for good. 
As the Bonapartes returned to mainland France, the Jacobins and their Committee of Public Safety were gaining more power in the Republic. Napoleon, by then, was becoming a much more stauncher ally of the Jacobins and out of his own pocket. He published a pamphlet with a fictional story about a pro-Republican soldier. One of those who chanced upon the pamphlet was Augustin Robespierre, whose older brother, Maximilian, was the figurehead of the Jacobins. It was somewhat ironic that the Jacobins, who rose against the brutality and excesses of the French monarchy, now ruled with the same depravity as the royals. It's no wonder their one-year regime earned the nickname, the Reign of Terror, among the people. Thankfully for Napoleon, his published pamphlet won him favour with the Robespierres, resulting in his appointment as senior gunner and artillery commander. His first major task was to lead the regiment sent to reclaim the southern French city of Toulon. Toulon, a popular city on the Mediterranean coast, was a strategic naval port as all of the 26 French Mediterranean fleets were docked in its harbours. But now it was overrun by Federalist and Royalist rebels who were allied with British and Spanish forces. So overtaking it was a massive challenge to the young artillery commander, but Napoleon, who never shied away from a militaristic challenge, was up to the task. With his keen geographical and tactical expertise, Napoleon assessed that capturing two forts on the hill of Cairo in Toulon would paralyze the enemy's artillery from being resupplied by the British naval ships in the harbours. Fortunately, Napoleon's plan worked and after a four-month combat, Napoleon and his regiment finally overtook Toulon in December of 1793. Recapturing Toulon was crucial for the Republicans as it warned other revolting cities that the new regime would deal swiftly and decisively with insurrections. Just three days after the siege of Toulon ended, Napoleon was promoted to Brigadier General by Paul Barras, one of the right-hand men of the Robespierres. This was Napoleon's first real victory and his first major ascent up the hierarchy of the French military. Unfortunately, Napoleon's triumph was to be short-lived because upon his return to Paris, people were revolting against the Jacobins' reign of terror. On the 26th of July, 1794, Maximilien Robespierre was overthrown by an angry mob and executed two days later along with 21 of his closest allies, which became known as the Days of Thermidor. Fortunately for him, despite his public declaration of support for the Jacobins, Napoleon was only placed on house arrest for nine days and was not slapped with any criminal charges. Yet, he had difficulty getting assignments after his release because those in charge were still suspicious of him and his ties to the Robespierres. Someone who didn't write off Napoleon, though, was none other than Paul Barras, the former right-hand man of the Robespierres, who turned against them for their out-of-hand brutality. The regime that followed the Jacobins was the Directory, the governing five-person committee of which Paul Barras was a member. The Directory and their supporting Thermidorians tried to restabilize France politically and economically, even suggesting the creation of a new constitution. But several pockets of royalist and reactionary uprisings continued to pop up in western Paris, some becoming harder to control. Remembering Napoleon's success in Toulon, Paul Barras reinstated him and put him in charge of quashing these rebellions. This invigorated Napoleon, giving him an opportunity to redeem himself after his humiliating house arrest. He suppressed a bloody royalist insurrection in Paris in October of 1795, ordering his cavalry commander, Joachim Murat, to fire at the insurgents using grape shot. This extremely lethal weapon is cannon ammunition that consists of a canvas tube filled with a cluster of small iron balls that spread out upon firing. Napoleon's tactic was ruthlessly bloody, wiping out dozens of royalist insurgents which brought about the timely phrase with a whiff of grape shot. By the last quarter of 1795, Napoleon had already become a household name. The Directory promoted him to commander of the interior after successfully obliterating the insurgent uprisings. 
he was also handed over command of the Army of Italy, which was a field cavalry of the French army stationed on the Italian border. Around this time of his promotion, Napoleon was introduced by Paul Barras to Josephine de Bohane, who many scholars consider to be the love of Napoleon's life. Josephine, who was six years older and had two children from her first marriage, was a fixture in the aristocratic circles of Paris and also happened to be one of Paul Barras' mistresses. Napoleon was totally smitten with Josephine and wanted to marry her immediately. It's always been theorized that while she didn't love him with the same intensity as he did her, she still found him quite amusing. On the 9th of March, 1796, and with Paul Barras's blessing, Napoleon and Josephine officially married just five months after their first meeting. Two days after their wedding, Napoleon returned to work with a monumental task ahead of him to take command of the Army of Italy. The Army of Italy wasn't as mighty as it sounded because it was poorly supplied with uniforms and reinforcements that oftentimes the men had to rely on looting for food and other supplies. Morale was low while soldier unruliness was high, which Napoleon knew he had to deal with immediately. His first order was to improve the supply chain for reinforcements. Next, he instilled discipline among his troops, removing soldiers he felt were still loyal to the monarchy. Napoleon was skilled in galvanizing his men to loathe the enemy, this time the Austrians, and eventually earned his soldiers' respect and adoration. The 27-year-old commanding general truly showcased his ruthless tactical skills in this period, especially when it came to moving his regiment fast and unexpectedly, taking advantage of the terrain and having well-planned defense lines. His tactical maneuvers were so unparalleled at the time that they came to be known as Napoleonic warfare. From 1796 to 1797, Napoleon and the Army of Italy engaged the Austrian forces in bloody combat, with Austria conceding at last by the autumn of 1797. The Treaty of Campo Formia was entered into by both sides, whereby the Austrians ceded control of most of northern Italy and the Low Countries while they got to keep the Republic of Venice. This trade-off led Napoleon to believe that he was no longer just a mere military commander, but he was now an emerging political leader as well. He saw himself as someone who could engage in high-level geopolitical decisions on his own accord. With his resounding victories in the War of the First Coalition, Napoleon stayed put in Milan to savor his triumphs. He set up a palace in the city so the townspeople could have an audience with him if they had civil concerns, making Napoleon a sort of French emissary. In early December of 1797, Napoleon returned to Paris, widely exalted by the people. He left behind his king-like appearances in Milan, so as not to give away any indication of his desire for political power, especially to the likes of Paul Barras and the other members of the Directory. Upon Napoleon's return to the capital, he learned that the Directory now intended to target the country's longtime foe, the British. With Paul Barras at the forefront, the Directory commissioned Napoleon to lead an invasion but Napoleon realized that the naval forces of France were not up to par with the superior British Navy. Napoleon then had a standout strategy. Rather than going on the direct offensive, why not look to the east where they could cut off Britain's vital trade route to India by taking over Egypt? In early May of 1798, Napoleon and his army set sail for Egypt via Toulon, arriving in Alexandria near the mouth of the River Nile less than a month later. They had several clashes with the Egyptians and other Muslims in the region, among the deadliest being the Battle of Abukir, wherein Napoleon's cavalry general, Joachim Murat, faced off with the Ottoman army in July of 1799. French victory was swift as they completely vanquished the Ottomans, while only about 1,000 casualties were reported on their side. Besides militaristic conquest, Napoleon, who valued learning and enlightenment, brought along 167 scholars with him because he wanted them to harvest educational information about Egyptian mythology 
history and culture. It was in this very expedition that one of Napoleon's men, Pierre-Francois Bouchard, discovered the extremely valuable Rosetta Stone. This became the first ancient Egypt bilingual text recovered in early modern history. Good fortune, however, didn't stay on Napoleon's side that long. His army was heavily defeated against the Turks and the British in the Siege of Arca. Realizing that his Egyptian campaign was clearly a failure, Napoleon secretly departed in August of 1799, even if he wasn't commanded to do so. His hasty retreat meant he had to abandon more than 30,000 of his troops in Egypt, and it was natural that most of them felt betrayed by him. By October, Napoleon returned to Paris, where many assumed that his Egyptian campaign was successful thanks in part to his exaggerated tales. Back in Paris, he saw how the nation's coffers were running bankrupt due to excessive spending by the Directory, who were becoming more and more unpopular with the citizens. So, with the backing of his younger brother, Lucien, and top political influencers outside of the five-member unit of the Directory, Napoleon staged a bloodless coup in early November of 1799. They were able to pull this off because the military fully supported their commanding general. Without any resulting deaths, they toppled the five leaders of the Directory, and in its place, they set up the French consulate, with Napoleon being the first of three consuls now governing France. This regime change, however, was done differently than previous ones, with Napoleon and his co-conspirators arranging it through a plebiscite. This allowed all men, regardless of status, to vote whether they wanted leadership to transfer to the French consulate or to stay with the Directory. The plebiscite just gave off a veneer of giving the power of choice to the people when, in reality, it was Lucien Bonaparte who just counted the votes. And so it went, out with the Directory and in with the French consulate, with Napoleon now just one step away from being the ultimate leader of France. The French consulate's regime which was mostly just Napoleon's really, was relatively uneventful at first. Napoleon was able to keep civil unrest down as people just wanted security and stability after so many years of coups and vendettas. Likewise, in 1801, Napoleon entered a concordat, or agreement with Pope Pius VII, allowing the Catholic Church to return to France after being driven away during the French Revolution. Despite that, Napoleon refused to return a bulk of church property and endowments it used to possess that were seized in the 1780s. The French consulate's regime also established the Napoleonic Code, a set of clearly written and accessible civil laws, of which many provisions are still being used today. The Napoleonic Code was a significant milestone at the time as it ended the obsolete system of feudal laws governing France back then. However, one of the more unfair provisions in the Napoleonic Code was its legislation on women. Basically, women had no rights as everything was decided for them by the patriarch of the house. It is rather unfortunate that Napoleon decided upon this even though he himself placed his own wife, Josephine, on a pedestal. How's it going as you learn more about Napoleon Bonaparte? Was he really worthy of all the hype? We hope you continue to watch as the final chapter of his highest ascent to power is coming right up. Napoleon's seemingly peaceful regime with the French consulate was about to be unraveled. By the year 1800, Austria reoccupied northern Italy by attacking a French garrison in Genoa, causing the War of the Second Coalition. This drove Napoleon to confront the Austrians in an effort to decimate them once and for all, leading his army over the Swiss Alps into Italy so they could attack the Austrians by surprise. Napoleon's discreet position in the Alps meant that they had now created a barrier for the Austrian army's lines of communication. On the 14th of June, 1800, Napoleon and his troops fought against the Austrians at the Battle of Marengo near the city of Alessandria in Italy. It was Napoleon who was actually caught by surprise when the Austrians attacked them in Marengo, owing to Napoleon's miscalculation of the number of his troops by spreading them too thinly. It also didn't help that the French troops were outnumbered by the Austrian soldiers by around 8,000 men, 
so Napoleon had no choice but to order his forces to fall back momentarily. Assuming that Napoleon's regiment was already on the verge of surrendering, General Michael von Mellers, the Austrian commander, put his guard down and returned to his headquarters prematurely to report Napoleon's apparent defeat to his army superiors. Von Mellis did not realize that there was a second wave of French forces coming in from nearby, led by General Louis Desse. Napoleon's tactical retreat worked as they were now reinforced by Desse and his men, enabling them to pounce on the Austrians and ultimately defeat them. Ruefully, General Desse was killed in battle, which gave Napoleon the opportunity to claim all the credit for the victory. The success of the Battle of Marengo primarily sealed Napoleon's ruthless campaign to conquer Italy in the 1800s. After his astounding conquest, Napoleon headed back to France, where he managed to get the Austrians to sign the Treaty of Luneville in February of 1801. Soon after, the British entered into a treaty with him, known as the Peace of Amiens in March of 1802, bringing the Revolutionary Wars to an end. The following three years brought relative stability and placidity in continental Europe, with France becoming the dominant nation. Imagine what this did for Napoleon's popularity, with the people finally having their saviour, someone who brought peace and economic stability to the region. And imagine, even more, what this did for Napoleon's own image of himself, the mighty ruler yet still a rung lower in the hierarchy of supreme leaders. It was this hunger for limitless power that Napoleon commissioned another plebiscite, this time letting the people decide if they wanted Napoleon to be first consul for life, which won him 99% of their approval. From 1802 to 1805, however, assassination attempts were still aimed at Napoleon. In January of 1804, his police discovered a secret plot to assassinate him, planned by the House of Bourbon, one of the leading royal houses of France. Napoleon retaliated by capturing and then executing Louis Antoine de Bourbon, the Duke of Enghien, even though Louis had no hand in the secret plot. The Duke's execution infuriated other royal courts around Europe, which helped fuel the start of the Napoleonic Wars. Napoleon justified the secret plots against his life as the reason to hold one more plebiscite, this time to remove the two other consuls and finally elect him as Emperor of France. An astounding 3.6 million men came out for the plebiscite, giving Napoleon even more than 99% of their votes. So, at last, on the 2nd of December 1804, Napoleon was put on the throne as the reigning emperor. And in true Napoleonic fashion, during his historic coronation ceremony, which was officiated by Pope Pius VII, Napoleon yanked the crown off of the Pope's hands as he deemed the only one who could really crown him was himself. Napoleon believed that he rose to become emperor by his own merit and by the will of the people, and not through a royal succession by bloodline. On the same day, Napoleon also crowned Josephine as Empress of France, becoming only the second woman in French history to be anointed and crowned apart from Marie de Medici. In just a little over 10 years, Napoleon Bonaparte went from being an unknown artillery officer to becoming the emperor of the largest empire Europe had seen in a thousand years. Emperor Napoleon dominated France and continental Europe until 1814, then briefly again in 1815. But his insatiable desire to lord over all brought his downfall as many European nations banded together in fluctuating coalitions to bring Napoleon down. And by June of 1815, they finally defeated him. Thank you for watching History of Life. We hope you enjoyed this extensive exploration of Napoleon Bonaparte's rise to power. We will continue to analyze his life and conquests in future videos, as the man indeed had one of the most fascinating trajectories in world history. Like this video and subscribe to our channel to watch more videos like this. And don't forget to hit that notification bell to know when the next one comes out. See you in the next video.